In Australia, a former defense lawyer faces jail time over the leak of controversial files on the war in Afghanistan. David McBride released classified material in 2017 alleging Australian troops committed war crimes in Afghanistan. The government were hoping that I'd plead guilty to it, get some sort of a light sentence. I wanted a major trial because that was the only way I could put the government on trial. Credible evidence that Australian elite soldiers unlawfully killed 39 people during the Afghan war. They kept on saying everything is okay in Afghanistan. It's collapsed in a heap uh, as everybody on the inside knew it would. And now people are beginning to say, well, what else was a lie? Politicians would do anything to save their own skin put innocent people in jail, give medals to guilty people, lie about whether the war was uh, going anywhere. It also showed the bigger problem that we just did not care about the truth. I contemplated suicide on cliffs like this. I think what stopped me jumping off was uh, the ghosts of the Anzacs. Something made me feel if I kept on fighting, I would eventually win. Each day I would come home exhausted with the Department of Defence. I knew they were trying to cover something up in the Defence Force, but I couldn't see what. Australian elite soldiers unlawfully killed 39 people during the Afghan war. Quite a lot of soldiers did the right thing, and sometimes the government tried to make scapegoats of them and it's just as much my duty to stand up for soldiers who are being scapegoated as it is to stand up on behalf of the people who were murdered to make sure they get justice. Hi I'm David McBride and I'm proud to introduce this film you're about to see, Declassified. In September, I will be facing court charged with leaking government secrets as a whistleblower. If convicted, I face a lifetime imprisonment. This film was produced independently by Trees and Flowers in an attempt to tell my side of the story and to show you my journey for the past couple of years. I hope you enjoy it and I hope it inspires other people to stand up against injustice. I met David through my brother, Noah Matarike, who's also one of the producers. Um, and Noah is a social media marketing genius. He handles all of David McBride's social media accounts. So David, I think he had in mind of doing a video series, like, like, a, uh, like a video story. But his reference was the Kardashians. <laughs> and he wanted to do something like that and I think I said I think we could do better David <laughs> um, so we had a, a couple phone calls um, and I literally met him the day before we started shooting and immediately there was a connection it's a weird one because he really did change my perception of what I thought an ex-military person is. He is funny, he is intelligent, he is also like in touch with his emotions. I had that typical thing, that stereotypical view of what an ex-soldier is. You know, they're rough, they fight, you know, they, you know, they just, but then he wasn't any of that. So he really, uh, challenged my perception of what an ex -mitter. So we decided that the documentary that we're gonna film, we're gonna do it in a day, and we should follow a day in the life, because we really didn't have much of a script per se, but we just said like, what do you do in your day? And let's just follow that. So as an army man, he wakes up at 5 a.m. So we started at 5 a.m. And then we just kind of followed him throughout his whole day. And then that was the format. So, yeah, that's the story. Oh, congratulations. It's a fabulous film. And it deserves to be seen by more people. So what are the plans regarding distribution? Um, 
I think there has been talks between myself, David, and Noel that maybe we should do like a national tour to go to other cities. So we start with Sydney and the response has been positive. Thank you all for showing up. Um, and maybe we can go to Melbourne or Adelaide and stuff. But I've always thought in my mind, we know there's a bigger story. If the trial is happening, there could be a potential to make like a bigger feature. So this documentary, I kind of see it as a preliminary work. So hopefully we can approach some organizations like look at what we have. I think there's a bigger story that's followed up to make into the bigger story. I'll probably take a couple of years just to follow the process of the trial. Yeah. I'm sure it is going to be a big story. It's a big story now and it's going to get bigger. Um, Zoe, lovely to meet you. Uh, David tells me you're a tremendous supporter. And I wondered if you could tell me what it's meant to you and the Afghan community. What David has done, what has it meant to you and the Afghan community? Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. And um, I feel like I'm more nervous than David. <laughs> Some reason. So, um, what it meant to us um, when I first watched the Afghan files and read the Brereton report, I think it was a consensus that most Afghans or every single Afghan, um, the Afghan diaspora in Sydney, was hurt and shocked. And um, it was one of those stories that we've always heard. We've, we've, we know about it, that there are incidents in Afghanistan that's not um, merely casualties of war, but there were incidents like this. So what David did for us, he gave us closure. He, he accepted and acknowledged what was happening over the, um, on ground. And it's been two years now, I started this petition on change.org have our Aussie whistleblower and this petition has received worldwide attention. Uh, we've obtained now 70,000 signatures. So for those of you who have not signed yet, it's change.org forward slash save our Aussie whistleblower. I've got members of our Afghan community here present tonight, quite scattered actually, um, that I've just come here to thank you Thank you, and, and um, they want to extend their heartfelt gratitude to David because he fought a battle that was not his only. He fought for us, for the Afghan justice. Um, this is very courageous. Um, it's very heartwarming and overwhelming to know that someone cares for us. He's also redeemed the reputation of the military and the Australian nation. And like David said, um, in his video, if I have to go to prison to do the right thing, I will. You did the right thing, David. You. <laughs> you did the right thing. You stood by us, and we are forever grateful to you. Um, and that's all I have to say. Zoe, we learnt today that the Australian government has missed the deadline to make a decision about paying compensation to the 39 individuals who uh, were killed allegedly unlawfully. And the Brereton Inquiry recommended that compensation was paid promptly to people where there was credible evidence, and he believed there was credible evidence. Now, they've missed the deadline. Um, what's your reaction to that? Because Afghanistan today is experiencing great hardship, hunger, poverty, uh, largely because the United States have uh, usurped Afghanistan's money and Australia uh, hasn't paid compensation when they could have to people who are uh, in dire need back there. What's your reaction to that? If I have to be honest, it makes me angry. Um, this is because, like you said, when they had the opportunity to help, they did not. And now we've got the Taliban regime back in Afghanistan, putting us back 20 or 40 or 50 or 60 years back. And, you know, we've got all these limitations of not being able to um, send funds and as 
far as I'm concerned, it's all excuses. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you for your support of that. Now, Mark, you're coming to this with a very interesting background. Many of you here will know uh, Mark. So you, you bring together through journalism and the law, you know, you're interested in accountability and commitment to justice. And I want to ask you first about press freedom, because the government's constantly banging on about press freedom in other countries. Um, they haven't prosecuted journalists in Australia, though they're very happy for Julian Assange to die in US prison. Uh, but they are pursuing whistleblowers relentlessly. What sort of press freedom can we have without whistleblowers? Well, of course, you can have none. Um, and it's what drew me, as a journalist, I, I became interested because I was always working with whistleblowers. So it's what drew me uh, to this area of the law. Um, but I, I have a more bleak view on that merely. I think, you know, journalism has gone down the, the tube uh, anyway. So maybe it's only the whistleblowers that can save us, right? It is only people who make uh, public declarations on important issues and so to show some courage. I can tell you there's uh, uh, multiple stories that cannot be um, publicised in Australia. So I'm, I mean, I hate to sound sort of a little bit miserable, I'm sort of giving up on the media and I'm rather, rather appreciating whistleblowers. The comment that was made earlier was a, a brilliant comment uh, that David has, is redeeming uh, Australia's reputation, David, is redeeming the reputation of the Australian military. I mean, what a profound thing to say, and it's utterly true. The very man they want to throw in a jail is the one man that might redeem some skerrick of integrity for us. It, it's very similar to Bernard Clary, uh, who was the whistleblower about the oil deals in East Timor. I can promise you, Bernard Clary is a hero in uh, East Timor. And <clears throat> as they discover, as the Timorese discover what Australia did to them, the only thing you would think, you would think they would put uh, uh, Bernard Clary, you know, on a golden chair and carry him to East Timor and it would, everything would be uh, repaired. No, they want him in jail. They want McBride in jail. It is staggering to me. Um, uh, when David and I first met, he was very, lonely man really, I don't, not on a personal level, he had some friends, but he's, he was isolated. Uh, he, he had nowhere to turn. No one was patting him on the back, because remember this, the Brereton report hadn't happened when they were trying to put David in chains. The uh, Ben Robert Smith trial, or the defamation proceeding, uh, which would be the closest we ever get uh, to a uh, war crimes proceeding was Great irony that it's in a, his own defamation proceeding. None of that happened. So, you know, David was really staring into the into the eyes of the beast, and you know, look, we, we loved him for that actually. And, and uh, can I? I'm only going to get one shot at this mirror. Stop it. <laughs> um, so, even though David is they're portraying him as a criminal. They want to put him in jail and they want society to see him that way. What I can say is people's attitude <coughs> to David has utterly transformed and uh, it's one of the things that I'm proudest to have been part of, part of what happens in courtrooms. Normally when you're accused of something, the society is divided uh, about what they think of you. I don't think there's any division about David McBride. The Australian people are behind David McBride. The prosecution of David McBride comes from the very narrow area. A particularly narrow and self serving uh, group um, who merely, merely, so no attention, no light is shined uh, upon them. So, um, and he does have support, and, and to give a, a, a bit of a bright light uh, to, to tonight. I mean, an incredible thing has happened uh, to David, which we, we haven't um, really publicly announced. But he applied for uh, his, uh, to, to be admitted again as a, a, 
a lawyer in New South Wales. It went to the New South Wales Law Society and it's been approved. <laughs> and, and that's quite a radical action. I mean, I, I really tip my hat to the Law Society, a long, elaborate process. Uh, it's not easy to be um, facing uh, life, in prison, <laughs> life in prison and get the law to get back. But he did, and there it is in black and white. Criminal lawyer. Criminal lawyer. And he's regarded as a man of fit and proper standing that uh, would, would well represent uh, a lawyer. So that's a really great thing. And uh, he's also now working, he started working just sort of quietly for Sydney City Crime. Uh, I've got some association with it. David's now back in the courts. Uh, no one knows it, but he's out there. And, uh, <laughs> So, Mark, give us an update on where we are with David's case. What's likely to happen? There's a tri the trial starts in September. Uh, I, I will, because if there's some supporters here, it's important to know. His trial is being is cut in two. Uh, in September, it's a very unique uh, proceeding. It's the public interest disclosure defence. This is essentially Australia's whistleblowing uh, legislation. We have it. It's never been used in seven years, which uh, probably gives some indication of uh, uh, the difficulty in, in, in getting into it. But David's will be the first at the Supreme Court, and uh, we're running that defence. It's a difficult one. If he wins the pit, uh, he goes home. If he loses the pit, he then the whole criminal proceeding starts. So he's into the long yards. If he loses PID this year, he'll have a criminal trial in the middle of next year. It's why I'm so glad he's going to get back into being a lawyer and getting on with his life, not just being crippled by this. Because this is what they do to you. They cripple you for two to three years. So it's, it's a long road. So hang in. Mark, just one final question. One, one of the things that's of great concern is that we are starting to have secret trials in this country. Uh, in Bernard Caleri's case, uh, there was one hearing where he was, not only was he not allowed to be present, his lawyer wasn't allowed to be present, so they appointed a lawyer who wasn't, couldn't tell him what happened during the day. It's extraordinary. Uh, is this likely to happen? No, in, it, ha it has happened. We just haven't um, uh, made, uh, made too much of it, frankly. We, uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, Bernard is the first train off the is the first in the first carriage on the train, so he's confronting this. We're, we're in the caboose behind him. So as he wins or loses his struggles, we, we sort of follow him. So there's no point in us making the same objections. We also don't have the funds. Bernard's got a, a, a great uh, law firm, Cool and Tobin, who are backing him. Um, so he's fighting every stage. Not as good as us. And not, not as good as us, but they're certainly richer. <laughs> <laughs> they're certainly richer. Um, uh, but also, it, there's not much you can do about it, right? You can fight and fight and fight on these things, and you're losing. Okay, we, we, we have to live with it. It will be. You won't hear much about David McBride's trial. Uh, I mean, it, it's. Shocking, isn't it? I mean, it's truly shocking. I mean, I understand, if I see some of this material, I just need to be careful in what I refer to. But it's understandable. Uh, a sliver of it is understandable. Something that might reveal an Australian technique or Australian contacts or something that would expose somebody. And the lawyers are used to that. Everyone agrees that we would have no objection. But they've thrown a, a blanket over 80% um, of uh, David's uh, proceedings, uh, it's, it, it's impossible to run it in any, any public way. Can I point out one other thing though? What you're referring to is not just about national intelligence, it's happening across the whole civil sort of space for people that are whistleblowing on powerful organisations. Do you mind if I embarrass you, Troy? Stand up, Troy. Troy, uh, Troy Stoles is a, a, um, a client of ours. Troy was a whistleblower. Uh, he worked for clubs in South Wales. And I cannot say much more than that. You can sit down, Troy. Uh, <laughs>
Google him. Um, you, you, you can Google him. Before they started putting the gag down his throat and mine, you can Google him, Troy Stoltz. And so it's not national security, it's just taking on powerful organisations and you'll never hear of Troy Stoltz uh, in the coming months until we can try and undo that. So it's really becoming very grim, the whole secrecy issue. David, your life has been a living hell for years now. What I'd like to know is, uh, has anyone been held accountable for the war crimes that you've revealed? Held accountable, um, prosecuted, investigated, uh, with respect to the Afghan files. Has that happened? Do I want to stand up for this? No. It's a good question and um, it links into what Mark said. While you don't need to know all the ins and outs, I mean, you can see from the movie, I'm a pretty uh, straight up and down, well, when I'm not straight up and down, but I, I am a person from an establishment background who tried to do the right thing and wanted to do the right thing and wanted to be a soldier. Uh, and I was a lawyer a long time ago and I'm a lawyer now. Uh, I'm not an anti-establishment activist, but I can tell you things are very bad in this country. <clears throat> Bernard Cleary's case, while you, you won't necessarily understand it, what it means is if the government, the Liberal Party, or the Labour Party, have a major donor and you might even be working for a company who's a minor donor. But the major donor gives more money to the company than your company. And the major donor's directors say to the government, we want you to kill the bloke who works for the minor company. And ASIO uh, or ACES would do it. And you know the only person that would go to jail is the person that spoke about it. That's not an exaggeration. That is what's happening. <coughs> We know about Cleary's case, we know about my case. There may be a hundred cases when every case I looked into in the Defence Force was rotten. This country, we are getting towards a sort of Hunger Games type thing. As, as Mary said, and the reason I have to uh, pause about it, no one has been prosecuted for murders. Most of you will have seen the clear execution of an Afghan sitting in a field, minding his own business with his prayer beads by an SA soldier. That is a murder. That man has not even been charged. I am facing a lifetime imprisonment. The government is so arrogant, they don't even think they need to explain why. We are, you don't have to worry about the ins and outs. <coughs> Mark, me, the rest of the team, Paul, we will fight for you. Uh, we will fight until we are dead, but it's pretty serious out there. It is really very, very serious. And the government don't even have to uh, explain themselves. And that's right. It could be the only person, not just here, but in America, um, in uh, Britain, the only people who end up in jail over the absolute disgrace to the Western world and everything we're meant to believe in, are Julian Assange, uh, myself, and a handful of other people that try to do the right thing. Uh, now, if they get away with that, um, the Western world, uh, as we know it, is an end. And that is why I'm, I'm so happy to have it, some Afghans here tonight. Uh, the only way we are going to heal this is to acknowledge our problems. We have to acknowledge what we did wrong to the Afghan community. Um, I know from AA the way you fix problems is you, is you clean your side of the street first. And there's a real ignorance in the Western world where we don't want to admit faults. As Mary said, we haven't even paid compensation to the 39 people who were clearly murdered. There's no doubt about it. Um, and even if there was any doubt, you reckon you might throw them a bit of money we spent $6 trillion or something, 
bombing it out of existence. You think it might be a bit of good PR, but we might have just paid up. No. These are not good people. I mean, I come from this situation as a soldier and I have a lot of, I, I have to admit, I have a lot of sort of uh, violent imagery in my head about it. I mean, I grew up in the Second World War imagery. And in some ways you're lucky to have a really despicable enemy is a great gift as a soldier. And these guys are bad. Don't be fooled. Nothing that they say is true. I and mean, look at the Brewington Inquiry. They put it on, and I, insiders like myself suspected it was not bona fide from the beginning. Not that there's anything wrong with Brewington. But uh, there were clear findings of murders, terrible things. And yet, despite that, despite that, and there were all the fuss that was made, no one's been charged. Uh, it looks like a Bellum will be charged. Uh, there's been a defamation action where all the information about my case has been put in the public domain. They're still trying to say it's secret, even though it's in the public domain. And no one's been paid compensation. Uh, everything that the government does is window dressing, and it's no substance. And if this is just the beginning for me. It's not just about avoiding jail. It's not about that. It's about changing the way the Western governments do things so we no longer think lying is good enough. Lying about what we're doing in the global south, lying um, to our own people, putting on fronts, becoming the very worst kind of car salesman. And that's why I'm so happy that the Afghans are here. I need them to know that there are people in the West who know that's wrong and who don't accept that and who will not rest until uh, we get justice for the Afghans. And not just that, we really change the way the governments of the West carry out their business in their patronising, sinister, uh, despicable, uh, imperialist man. Just a final question. Sorry. Just a final uh, question, David. Uh, I mean, we're all here tonight because we want to believe in democracy and accountability and decency and justice. We have, uh, we're in, we have an election campaign on and your hearings in September. What can we do now and going forward? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, as I said, I come from a soldier background and I wouldn't waste your time on just complaining, you know. We, we, we can win this, and I'm very glad to see um, uh, Jeff Morris is here as well, and, uh, and also Peter Fox. Jeff Morris was, was instrumental in getting the Banking Royal Commission going, uh, and Peter Fox was instrumental in getting the um, Royal Commission into uh, child institutional child abuse. Now, they were victories. We can actually score victories. It's not a matter, it was a day when uh, you know, being an activist was about having a long face and wearing a placard. Uh, those days are gone. We are here to actually get results. And those two guys, it's always good for me to see them because they've got results. Not everything's going to be perfect, but we need the one, there's only one important thing that's going to come out of this election, and that is a federal ICAP. We need that. We need to vote to get a federal ICAP. It's not about the prosecutions an ICAC um, produces. An ICAC is had like having a, a sniper on the hill. You might only shoot one person, but everyone else is a little bit scared. And that's, that's the idea. Don't worry about the one person that gets caught by ICAC. Think about the thousand that are a little bit scared about taking that bribe, a little bit worried about what they said on the phone. Uh, it will work. It's not going to be, um, you 
you know, stock can change everything, but it's a step in the right direction. I mean, we can work on getting Assange out. Uh, we can work slowly. I do believe this is a battle we can win. Um, and so but I think if you can vote for a good independent, vote for a good independent, or, or a green in the Senate, uh, there's going to be a Labor Prime Minister. But we need to keep them honest, and in the independents and the Greens will do that. Uh, then we make sure that we do get an ICAP, and then we start applying the pressure. Don't worry about the details, we'll do that. But I do have some thank yous as well. I need to thank you. I need to thank everybody for coming here. It's a really big deal for me. This is one of the important nights of my life. It's only, it's not Wembley Stadium, but it's important. It is important. This is the beginning of something. It's not the end. This is the, this is the lighting of a lighting of a fuse, which will get bigger and bigger. If you notice, if, if you see the Elton John um, uh, biopic. What's it called? Audience participation? Anyway. Rocket Man. Rocket Man. Now, the, the best moment in Rocket Man and, uh, is not when he's playing Wembley Stadium, but when he plays that very small but cool place in Los Angeles and he plays Crocodile Rock and he starts levitating because he's had so much drugs or something. But that, that's when it's a small thing. That is this. That is tonight. Uh, we will go on from here, and you are, while I am grateful for everybody being here, my family, Sarah, get me alive, my, my law firm, Mark is right. Uh, I was, you know, I was being quite close to the end. I was very friendless when Mark came to see me, um, and they said, we'll take your case, and I was like, oh, yeah, well, well. And um, I didn't have any money to pay them, and I uh, yeah, that was what it was like. I was like, I was ready to go to jail. I could have, there are many, Many lucky coincidences. I could have easily been dead. I've been very, very lucky with people. Zoe, I never met Zoe. Zoe heard about my case um, and decided to start a petition. You know, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, I'm a good person, but that is, you know, that is a really good person that does that. It's, here's about, brings about, and I'd like to thank you. You know, there are no good people here tonight. I'm going to forget that the Mary and, and people that, have, that have don't owe me anything, and there's people I've known forever that are here too, but have come out and offered me assistance. And uh, at a time, you know, I, if, if, the different flips of the coin, I could easily be dead. I could easily have already been in jail. If Mark hadn't stepped in with his team, I would have already been in jail. Christian Boyd was still around you know uh, it's we're going to win this no need to be depressing it's a time to be happy it's a time to celebrate it's a time to be it's rare as you said you have a despicable enemy uh you get to beat them you get to celebrate beating them uh it's a perfect storm in that way nothing like winning and, and beating someone who deserves a good beat and uh, <laughs> that's what you're all part of uh, it really, I want to see us again. There's no reason why we can't have a good time while we change the world. Uh, I want to see you all, that's our motto. I want to see you all next year at the party, celebration party down in Long uh, which I'm sure Waverley Council will agree to. Some Afghan cuisine. Afghan cuisine, Afghan dancing, Zoe and her friends. We are going to, Afghan, in fact, it might be Afghan dress, I think. I always knew, um, I've, I've always had a spiritual connection. I knew when I went to the Khyber Pass uh, for the first time back in 2000 that Afghanistan was going to be part of my life. And Sarah said, everything in my life has brought me to this moment. I do believe that. I do believe my life is always going to be entwined with Afghanistan and Afghanistan with me and this cause. And from this cause, we're, we're going to set an example of what good people in the West can do and we are going to take that example and do uh, great things. This is the beginning of something fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for you being here. Um, you know, I can't thank everybody who's, who's helped me so much. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you.